Okay, here we go on our final unit, um, which is gonna be anthropology, entomology, and odontology because they all go together. I guarantee you this is how I'm gonna end up, um, totally. Okay, so first let's define what forensic anthropology is. So once again, anytime we take the methods of a discipline and apply it to legal matters, boom, there it's a forensic discipline. So anthropology um, and also archeology, span which we'll define those, um, when we are applying those to either criminal or civil cases, that's when we get forensic anthropology. So one of the main things that anthropologists do is they help to identify who a particular person is. And we're gonna be talking about them dealing primarily with skeletonized remains. And skeletonized remains can include bones, teeth, and cartilage. So anthropologists are trained to deal with all of those. So you may have a, a person who's discovered, um, you know, they're either in a really advanced state of decomposition, um, or they're skeletonized and there's simply not enough soft tissue for a pathologist to figure out who they are, that's when the anthropologist can come in and be of assistance. Um, they're also really good to help recover buried remains because that can be a very intricate um, and difficult thing to do. They also aid with facial reconstruction and in specific cases, they can help determine um, the cause of death and potentially the manner of death. Um, so I know before in the, the question, the liberal arts question, we talked about the hyoid bone. Okay, that's a, a specific way that an anthropologist by looking at that could help determine, okay, this was probably manual strangulation um, and the manner of death would be homicide. So here is when forensic anthropology is used. So when remains are found and they cannot be visually identified, and there's a couple of um, you know, examples of when this can happen. And this is really what connects anthropology to entomology and also odontology, okay? The, the remains are not visually identifiable. So the examples here are um, the person is in an advanced state of decomposition. So, you know, obviously, you know, we know how that changes people's visual appearance. Um, if the, the body is burned beyond recognition, um, if the remains are fragmented. So for example, you know, a high speed plane crash, um, you know, think of United 93, you know, that hit at about 500 miles per hour. Um, you're going to have people that are not decomposed, but they are not intact. They're going to be highly fragmented. And so anthropologists can be very useful in determining, um, okay, this leg belongs with this torso. They're from the same person. And then also, if the remains commingle, um, for example, in mass graves, which are seen in um, uh, cases of genocide. So here's an example too of how they can help with facial recognition. Um, so what the anthropologist will do is by looking at the skull, they're able to figure out um, tissue thicknesses. And you see these little things right here, they're almost like pencil erasers. Um, but from that, then they're able to determine what potentially the person could have looked like. And of course, this can be very useful in, especially in missing persons cases. So here's an example, you know, I apologize for the graphicness of this photo, but this would be an example, um, you know, of what remains could potentially look like in a mass disaster, such as an airline crash. So these would be considered probably identifiable. Um, you know, you can see there's a lot of soft tissue, so potentially could do DNA. Um, also, if you look here, there's actually teeth and part of a jaw. And so that could aid um, also in identification, but obviously this person is not visually identifiable. So an anthropologist, um, also an odontologist is going to be very helpful in this case. So I'd mention also forensic archeology. span So 
Anthropology deals with the remains themselves, okay? So bones, teeth, cartilage. Archaeology is basically the stuff that's found with the remains. So classic archaeologists, you know, if you think of, you know, Raiders of the Lost Ark, where they're looking for, you know, artifacts or things, um, that can also be very useful too. So really forensic anthropology also combines archaeology. Okay, so for example, you know, here is an ancient civilization where they actually lived underground. So anthropologists, you know, especially if they're cultural anthropologists, would be interested in looking at what types of tools did this population have? How were they able to survive in this particular um, community? Okay, what I want to mention now is the methods used for locating human remains. Now, this is not identifying who the person is. These are just methods that can be used to potentially, um, you know, find and say, you know, are, could there potentially be maybe a mass grave or is someone buried here or how do we find these remains? So these are methods discussing that. So aerial photography can be useful um, if, you know, you see, for example, okay, when a person decomposes, um, they're going to basically have purge fluid um, and it will kill vegetation near their body. So when you look for areas of dead vegetation, also, if someone has been buried, look for disturbances in the soil. So um, the, the topsoil is always going to be lighter in color as opposed to um, the soil beneath the surface. So that can potentially be detected with aerial photography. Infrared identifies heat. So that would have to be a person that either is still alive or recently deceased because of course with algor mortis, they're going to lose um, their body temperature until they reach ambient temperature. Metal detectors can be really useful because um, most of the time, you know, a person will have a watch or a ring or earrings or uh, some type of metal, um, you, you know, if they, even if they've been buried. Um, one other thing that can happen is, you know, a, a person who's trying to make sure that someone is really dead, a lot of times will shoot them through the head just to make sure. And then they're not going to take the time usually to then dig under that person to be able to take that projectile with them. So it can also be very useful to potentially find um, bullets and cartridge casings. Okay, ground penetrating radar, um, it can potentially tell you where a disturbance is beneath the soil. Um, you know, it's not to the point where you're gonna see, you know, a detailed skeleton and you're gonna be able to tell exactly what's there, but it can tell you, okay, you know, we have a soil disturbance, potentially there could be something buried here. Um, so let's go ahead and, you know, do an excavation. Now it could be, okay, that was the family pet that was buried, or maybe there's something going on with the water table underneath the, the surface. So um, it gives uh, a, it basically gives a starting point that there could be something buried there. And then finally, geographical information systems, which um, you know allow satellite data to pinpoint exactly locations of remains. And this is absolutely essential when you're dealing uh, with you know huge scenes, such as as I mentioned, um, you know a high speed plane crash where you're gonna have remains scattered um, across terrain. And the only way to really pinpoint those remains is to use geographical information systems. Um, I'm also gonna talk about cadaver dogs, but we'll get to that um, in a little bit. So a little bit of the history of forensic anthropology. Um, the nice thing, there's only one guy for you to know in this section. So his name was Dr. Thomas Dwight. And he is considered the father of American forensic anthropology. And what he was is he was the person in charge of the cadaver lab at Harvard Med School. So when people go to medical school, they have to take gross anatomy, which means that they have to dissect a human cadaver and you know really delve into the study of anatomy. And Dr. Dwight was the first person to notice that you know, we could potentially come up with a biological profile simply from taking measurements 
from skeletal remains. So, um, you know, you could tell if a person had a particular occupation or taking measurements to potentially determine the race and the gender of that person. So he was really the first person to come up with that idea. And the nice thing about running the cadaver lab is they knew exactly who these people were, their medical history, their work history. Um, so they were able to start developing a database as to um, determining someone's biological profile via skeletal remains. So here is the lab. So first of all, there are very, very few full-time forensic anthropologists in the United States. And what kind of connects anthropology, entomology, and odontology is normally in a typical state, these are not full-time positions. Um, for example, a forensic anthropologist may be um, an anthropology professor at a local university, and then if they've gotten additional training in forensic anthropology, then um, they can work on consulting cases. So, you know, we in the state of Iowa, we don't really need a full-time forensic anthropologist in terms of casework. Um, it's more on a consultant basis. Um, however, if you want to be a full-time forensic anthropologist, the, the main lab that you would work in is the Central Identification Lab in Hawaii. So what this lab is, is they are responsible for recovering and identifying U.S. soldiers from all of the wars during the 20th century. Okay, so going back to World War I, World War II, you know, the current conflicts that we have going, unfortunately. Um, they're not going to look at remains from, say, the Civil War. It has to be 20, 20th century and beyond. Um, and unfortunately, they're kept very busy. Uh, what we find now is that a lot of soldiers are being killed by, um, you know, improvised explosive devices. So unfortunately, they're coming back fragmented. And it's this lab that can help make sure that all of the remains, um, you know, are put together and so that soldier can be given a proper burial. The other thing that they do, you know, I mean, it, it, it sounds great. Oh, I'm going to work at a lab in Hawaii, right? I'm going to drink Mai Tais and go surfing and lay on the beach. However, these are also anthropologists that are routinely dispatched worldwide to help with excavations of mass graves and dealing with other mass disasters. So um, they get deployed quite a bit. So yeah, it's not just kind of hanging out in Hawaii, having a vacation. So in 1972, the American Academy of Forensic Sciences, which is the largest international organization for forensic science, recognized forensic anthropology as a discipline. And I know for you guys, because you're young, it sounds like a super long time ago, but that's actually pretty recent. I think the only other discipline they've added since then has been um, digital forensic science, so computer forensics, things like that. So it's actually a pretty recent discipline. So one of the other things that was developed is something called the Forensic Data Bank. Okay, and I'm actually going to assign you, as soon as I get this video uploaded, um, a video for you to watch on that, and it's pretty interesting. So you may have heard um, of a place called The Body Farm, and The Body Farm is located at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, and it's basically where donated remains are left in different conditions to decompose and then teams of scientists study them. So you have the bug people in there, you have DNA people, you have anthropologists, you have chemists, and they watch the process of decomposition. The person who started this was Dr. Bill Bass, um, who is uh, a forensic anthropologist who worked there. And basically he messed up on a case and got the, a time of death estimate really, really wrong. And that got him thinking that we don't really have any data on decomposition. And so he's the one that started um, the body farm at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. So um, what happens is they watch these, you know, observe these donated remains 
and watch them decompose. And then when the body is not gonna decompose anymore, then they are, the bones are basically defleshed and cleaned and they can take human skeletal measurements. And also just like the cadaver lab, these are people who are donating their bodies. And so you know exactly who they are. You know their medical history, you know their work history, their social history. Um, and so when you take skeletal measurements, it allows that to be put into a database. And that's what we refer to as the forensic data bank. So it comes out of the body farm in uh, Knoxville, Tennessee. So for example, um, let's say unidentified remains are found somewhere in New Mexico and they're skeletonized. So the local anthropologist in New Mexico can take measurements, put them into this database and potentially get an answer that, okay, this is um, you know, likely an Asian female between the ages of 30 and 50. Um, obviously, the more data that goes in, the better this is going to be. So it's important that anthropologists all across the country um, put in data continuously. But, you know, is it foolproof? No. But can it help you narrow down potentially who these people are? Yes. Okay. So that's what the forensic data bank is. It comes out of the body farm. And I'm gonna get that, um, this video uploading and I will get that assignment up um, today. All right, thank you very much.